The players have unanimously decided to take action in response to the current collective bargaining negotiations between the NRL and our LPA. Recently, we submitted a proposal to the NRL and ARL commissioners that we believe was very fair and reasonable and met the players' requirements. Unfortunately, the NRL and the ARL Commission responded with changes that delivered us with significant changes that were restricting the rights and the conditions for players. It was very clear in the response that the NRL and the ARL commissioners felt that there was no further negotiation and they were not open to further discussion about any changes to the CBA. To make matters worse, the NRL and the ARL Commission have determined that in the four months left of this current CBA and the rollover period, that they will only pay the NRL players the COVID reduced benefits, despite accepting record revenue throughout the last 12 months. I'd like to emphasise that the gravity of this situation that we now find ourselves in today, that we are extremely disappointed in the breakdown of these negotiations, because we believe it's a blatant disregard to the rights and the welfare and well-being of all the players. This is, an, is absolutely a clear attempt to intimidate the players into a deal that they believe undermines their rights, their voice and their control over their own careers and unanimously they have agreed that they will not continue with these types of tactics. And that is why from Thursday the 6th of July tomorrow our players will be boycotting all broadcast and media engagements on days when the NRL and NRLW and State of Origin matches are scheduled. This includes pre-match, half-time, post-match interviews as well as press conferences and other media opportunities. Further details regarding this boycott, as well as the outcomes we're requesting from the NRL and the ARL Commission, will be provided in a statement, which I'm sure by now you will have received. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the strength and the courage of our players, particularly our NRLW players, who continue to break barriers and pave the way for the future generations of little girls that want to play this game. As a woman in a leadership role within the rugby league, I understand the significance of their, pre of, of their presence and the importance of their voices being heard. Our sport, our players and our fans deserve better and we stand with them and we urge the NRL and the ARL Commission to do the same. I'd now like to hand you over to our CEO. Yeah, thanks everyone. As the CEO of the Rugby League Players Association, I want to add to the Chair's message and provide further context. I'd also like to thank the recent facilitator of the negotiations for his dedication to achieve a good outcome for all. However, negotiations require a different approach, but his contribution is greatly appreciated. This issue hits home for me on a personal level. I've lived and breathed this sport as a fan, player and administrator for as long as I can remember. I understand the sacrifices our players make and the risks they take every time they step onto the field. Their careers can be fleeting and they deserve to have their rights and welfare protected. Over the past 20 months, we have seen a disturbing pattern of behaviour from the NRL 
and the RL Commission. What we have seen is a failure to respect the role of the players. Representative body, erosion of fundamental player rights and attempts to buy off players without understanding this CBA is about so much more than money. They have failed to honour their commitments in providing a CBA everyone can be proud of. One that respects the player's irreplaceable role. They did not properly disclose financial information and payments owed to players and disregarded their collective concerns. The players have shown tremendous patience and goodwill through this process but their trust and resolve has been tested time and time again. I want to be clear that we have been forced into this position and importantly, our issue is not with the media. Unfortunately, unless we were prepared to fail in our obligations to appropriately represent and protect our members, both current and future, the only choice we are left with is to take action. It's important to understand that this action will be seen by some players as not hard enough. But for now, this is considered appropriate action given the NRL's take, take it or leave it response, which now rewinds much of the good outcomes we were all optimistic of and hopeful of securing. We must also remember not to let this dispute overshadow the connection between the players and the fans. While there is no game without players, there is no profession without fans. Fans are the lifeblood of this game and our players are dedicated to playing for them and providing the entertainment they deserve. They have a deep connection with the community because they too all started this journey as a fan. We entered into negotiations with the hope of reaching a fair and reasonable agreement that addresses the needs and interests of all players, NRL and NRLW. We made concessions, we engaged in good faith and we presented a settlement proposal that did not ask for a single dollar more than what had already been agreed upon in December. Yet the NRL responded with over 100 changes that would have set the players backward in many key areas. This response was unacceptable with clear erosion of player rights, including taking away player rights on their personal player property and data and medical information, exploiting the player property, controlling how players spend their money on player funds and their benefits, increasing the number of matches without player agreement, and making players pay for things they shouldn't have to, such as insurances and other benefits that are not afforded to players. This player action is about safeguarding the integrity of the NRL and NRLW competitions and standing up for what's right. We urge the NRL and ARL Commission to come to the table and provide the players with a fair deal, one that everyone can move forward into the future and stand proudly behind. As one of the leaders in our game, I'm fearful and concerned about the trajectory of our game. With all major stakeholder agreements unsigned, unresolved and unannounced. These include the NRL and NRLW CBA, club licensing agreements, New South Wales Rugby League and Queensland Rugby League membership agreements, NRL and NRLW grand final venue and location and international rugby league schedule and structure. We need to come together and provide certainty for everyone. This must be a non-negotiable. Let us not forget our game is the only game in world sport that started due to players and workers' rights and a dispute that happened more than 100 years ago. Well, here we are again, except it's our own governing body that we're holding a dispute with. We are standing up and stepping forward to represent the will and conviction of all our players and the players that have come before them. And we will continue to stand firm for the benefit of current, past 
and future players and the overall health and success of the game. Thank you. I mean, obviously, sorry. Yeah. But you're, you're obviously hoping that this is going to be a circuit breaker, but apart from how you have been adding the sponsors, the broadcasters, and, and potentially the fans as well, what, what do you hope this is going to achieve? Well, we're presenting a way forward because um, we want we need to get back to the table with an independent uh, industrial relations mediator. I would suggest um, the players need to be paid. You know what they're owed um, pre-COVID reductions, uh, and we need a long-form CBA in place. This is about ensuring that we have a CBA in place for both our male and female players. The reality is, is come October 31 this year, there is no CBA in place. That will be a first of its kind since CBAs came in place in rugby league more than 20 years ago. So what are the main sticking points? Because this has been going on for 20 months or, or more. So where, where, what's the impasse about now? The impasse is exactly what I said. It's a, predominantly around player rights. Access to information, agreement rights on their fundamental employment rights, such as the increase of number of matches, personal and professional um, player data and medical information, uh, the controlling of their funds, uh, all those, you know, along with a number of other different things. Can you, can you be a little bit more specific? That is quite vague. What exactly do you want from the NRL? We want a fair deal. And we, we want to ensure that the player rights are protected. Do we think it's fair that the game can introduce more matches without agreement rights for the players? Do we think it's fair that the game takes control and we need to seek agreement on where the funds are distributed into the player funds and services, including how we run and our operations? And the list goes on. Clint, they're, they're broadcasts by two thirds of the game's revenue. In effect, you're punishing them for a disagreement with the NRL. Can you take us through why, take us through, through why they're being punished for the it's a really good question. Look, as you can see by the discomfort of everyone sitting here, none of us want to be here. None of us like this outcome. You are a key stakeholder in the game, but the players felt there was no alternative but to take this action. Can you understand the broad there's a backlash from the broadcast? I mean, they've oh, got definitely. the right to take money back from the NRL, I would yeah. imagine now, because you've, it's, this breach is their yeah. agreement. Absolutely. Which in turn would funnel down to the players anyway. Yeah. I would agree with everything you said. It's it's not the best situation to be in. However, we've left with no alternative. How do you feel this is fair to the fans? I think the, the fans, again, as I said, are front and centre here. The players are still performing their obligations with regards to playing and promoting the game, particularly for their clubs. Um, however, there will be restricted use of, of players in the media. Again, players are deeply connected to the community. But again, I ask you, what's the alternative? Accept something that, um, if we were to accept this today, you wouldn't be waking up tomorrow and being proud of it. Do you not feel it's robbing fans and a young kid who can't, on game day, hear from his favourite player? Yeah, and unfortunately, you don't take this, con you know, this decision lightly. But again, I ask you, what, what would, what's, what's the alternative? Because at the moment, we don't have an agreement. We're not in a position to reach agreement. And the alternative is accepting a substandard proposal that would have significant impacts on player rights and would set our game backwards. What reason, what reason has the NRL given for not wanting to go back to those pre-COVID rules and stuff? They don't believe they are obligated to pay them. Was any consideration given to a strike? Oh, look, again, what, uh, again, that's where as I've said in the in the press statement, is the fact that we don't. Some players will not believe this is hard enough, given we're 20 months into negotiations. Just let that sink in. You know, we shouldn't be here, uh, and we don't want to be here. But again, we're hoping that this is a circuit breaker uh, to these negotiations to be a good outcome for everyone. So, was there a significant issue of strike at the meeting last night? No, players players are reasonable. Again, you know, but ultimately um, you have to put everything on the table for players. You have to work through your process. And ultimately this is a, a player-led um, decision and we're right behind that. The coach is going to clearly apply with the boycott. How 
how do they feel about what you guys do? Sorry, the coaches? The coaches, yeah. Yeah, well, we don't represent the coaches. But do, they, uh, do the players have the support of the coaches given they won't be subject to the same rules around talking to media? Yeah, well, again, you'd like to think that given the circumstances of this and given the detail there, I think, you know, you'd like to believe that coaches would be behind them. But I can't speak on behalf of coaches. All I can speak on behalf of is what my job is. And our job is, is to represent our members. Dan, is this irreparable right now? I mean, there's been talk that you want Peter of exchange some pretty ugly emails. And it, it, can this be repaired? Is it, it, it that badly broken that is there a way back? Yeah. It's the people who are in yeah. charge. I believe it can. I have respect for, for Peter in so many ways. Um, we just see things with a different lens. And I think with the right arbitrator or mediator in the room, we can get there. I believe that. And I, th and I do believe Peter wants to get there. But the lens in which we're trying to achieve that is totally holes apart. I know you said a fair <coughs> deal, but what exactly will it take what do you want from the NRL to get to that point, like top level? Because it's hard for some to understand. Absolutely. What can you give us bullet points? What does the NRL need to do yeah. to get here? Well, it, there's more than 100 items in the CBA. It's a, a very complex document. Yeah. But to give you an example, our board of directors run an independent, not-for-profit organisation. And they have fiscal responsibilities to meet the demands of achieving the, the, the statutory requirements. Now, in the absence of having appropriate funding to be able to do that, and taking on board close to 64% more players to service without any, f any increase in funding for the operation of the RPL, just strongholds us. Then to be asked to take control of some of our governance, our board fe feels that that <coughs> is totally inappropriate and is not good governance for our organisation. So that's one example of many. Okay. Can you elaborate on a couple more? Clint might like to yeah, talk so about again, some of Again, as, as I've said, uh, I'll say it again, around the agreement rights about the introduction of all matches. So ultimately, if, if a player is obligated to provide another match, do we think it's right that the NRL can introduce that without agreement of players? Uh, again, the access and ownership of player data uh, the distribution of medical information, the erosion of our ability to be able to uh, allocate player share of revenue to the funds that they have chosen to open, including the Injury Hardship Fund, Medical Support Fund, Past Player Fund, Transitional Support, General Hardship Fund, the RLPA, how it runs its business. Again, do we think it's fair that a separate body that we are not accountable to, we're accountable to our members, takes control over those things. Clint, real terms, what could that data, what could that actually mean? Like the ownership of the data, for instance, could you just break that down from a fan point of view? How could that actually manifest? Yeah, well, ultimately, we, you know, players, if, if you're going to use player, pro player property and player data, you need informed consent. That is not being provided in this space. If you're going to use it, whether it's you know, to distribute it to other parties, commercialise it, that needs to be owned by players and we need to have informed written consent. We need to have equal rights on things that directly impact players. If you're going to use it, you need agreement. Tommy, can you give us a perspective on, on this? I'm sure yep. all this stuff flying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from a player's perspective, um, just speaking to players today, like they're very um, underwhelmed that we've, we've not come to an agreement just yet. And, and talking about um, examples, I think we, we look at we try to look after the bottom end of players and one thing the NRL have come back and changed uh, we talk about non-negotiables is uh, the minimum wage this year uh, has dropped by 10,000 non-negotiable uh, supplementary list player 85 gone down to 70 I mean it, we're not talking about big money here but that's a lot of money for those players who, who are struggling to make make way and try to be a professional athlete as well I just had conversations with players just recently who were on a trading wage which is currently $1,000 um, trading wage a week and we were pushing for 1200 and they've put, pulled that back now and these are all things that we agreed on um, players sat in meetings with Abdo himself and we had a whiteboard talked about um, these figures and pretty much had a handshake deal there and they've come back and said sorry um, this is uh, what we want and it's non-negotiable.
from this one you can bring real tapping sounds as well. It's great on it. You would have found the media after the game as part of the post match press conference. You don't have to do that now. I'm not sure whether you're happy or sad about that. <laughs> but it's a great moment for you and it's sort of being I don't know if it's overshadowed a little bit by this or what but yeah. Oh that's uh, this is what we're dealing with here is a lot bigger than that. Um um, yeah, we we're as a playing group, we we united and we we're together. It's not about one player, and um, you know, there's a lot more going on as well. We talk about origin. Um, you know, there's a lot of things going on there. The boys have media every day, so um, yeah, it's 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 a big deal, and um, this is what we want. We we don't want to be here, is what I'm trying to say. But the NRL have got a pretty easy option. I think they can stop all this. Do players understand it, Tommy? Do players understand what's going on? They've got a, a fairly good grasp on what's going on. Um, uh, as a player advisory group, we we try to inform the players as, as best as we can. We we send weekly updates as a, as a delegate as well, and we're across the players, and um, you know that works great. We we've had some really good uh, meetings this year and get-togethers, and yeah, it's all good. How do you feel about the fans in this situation, from your perspective? Because it does well, work. I just came from a, a NADOC event down at Heffron, uh, 10,000 10, people there. So I'd say we're still involved with the fans, and we, you know we're out there. Um, involvement, uh, we've we've got our social media. We we're uh, involved in that, and and I think just personally, the South are taking a lot of games. Uh, you know, on the road, we're going to Perth, we're going to Cairns, um, Sunshine Coast, players places like that, and um, we're. We're taking the game um, to places like that, engaging with the fans. Um, so this is not about uh, turning our back on the fans at all. We want to. We want a deal done. We want to go back to normal. And this was. Uh, we've been backed into a corner here. Um, what's your message to the fans? Because that most of them will see that headline salary cap figure, which is a big increase. But mm-hmm. most people in the community, they're not getting pay rises in that yep. current financial climate. What, would they? Can you explain to them, like, you know, are you being greedy? Like, what's, what's sort of the take out? Well, I think the key part is, Adrian, is that we, we haven't asked for a dollar more since December. You know, again, this isn't, this isn't a financial dispute at the moment. These are disputes on some fundamental rights, as I've explained, and many other things in this agreement. So, again, I can't, you can't say it enough. I mean, Tom said it. We don't want to be here. Like, but the point is, is the fact that at some point in time, you have to actually stand up for something you believe in and you say, no, this is enough. We have to step forward and stand firm. And, and again, having been a, a fan, as I said, for as long as I can remember and a player, I understand how deeply connected players are with the community. They, they, that's what makes our game great. The diversity in our playing group and the way in which they engage with the community is like no other code in the world. So again, this, this hurts players. But again, this is about so much more than that. It's not about just them. It's about the future of our game. It's about the future of our players that are going to come after them. It's about those that have dug the well. And, and again, uh, I know sometimes that's going to be hard to understand. But when you've lived it and you've breathed it for as long as we have, um, at some point in time, you have to push back and say no particularly when you're in a position where it's a take it or leave it. And that, that's where we are. And, and why now? Because obviously we've got a, a dead rubber in origin that needs promoting, like probably more so now than at any other point. Mm. Uh, we're at season two where club football sort of a little bit falls by the wayside because mm. of that origin promotion. Why, why have you decided to do this now? Well, we're, f- we're four months away from the end of the CBA. Since CBAs came into place in 2003, this would be the first time ever that we have not got a CBA in place. Mm. And, and so therefore, it's when, how long do we wait? It's 20 months into negotiations. This has been the most protracted negotiations I've ever been a part of. I've been a part of three of them before this one. Again, it's unacceptable that we're all here, but we're trying to provide a way forward. We're not walking away from negotiations. We're not saying take it or leave it. We've always been open to compromise. We've always been open to problem solving. But we're, we're not going to continue to have a situation where we're going to erode players' rights and their terms and conditions. We're happy to trade off for things that are equal of more value. That's part of negotiations. I get that. What happens if they turn around and go, stuff you? Come on. Take it. You, know, they said, you said they said take it or leave it. 
Well, well, I responded since I stopped you. Yeah, it's well, and that, that could happen. I can't control what happens, I, I can't control yeah, that. What happens, I but ultimately yeah. then we'll, we'll respond, we'll go back to our players, we'll work through our process if we have with this one, we'll engage our player leaders, uh, we'll communicate and consult with our board and reach agreement there and work through it. We have processes in place, but ultimately... Where that, is there to go, though? What's the next option? Well, again, we'd like to just focus on the current and present because ultimately if you're focused on what's next, then you're not living in the moment, which is actually getting a deal done. We want a deal. That's the whole point. We're not, we're not walking away from negotiations here. But again, um, we're asking the NRL to come back and work with us to reach agreement, but don't look through the lens of further erosion. This isn't a point scoring exercise. This is something that we all should be proud of and giving the players what they deserve. Again, this is, this is not a request for more money. It is a very real possibility that you don't come to an agreement. Mm. So how far are you prepared to go? Well, again, uh, we can only make decisions based on what the players are prepared to do. We don't dictate terms to our players. We don't run that way. We're a member-led organisation. So ultimately, we can address that uh, when and if it comes. And we're hoping that that doesn't happen. Because ultimately, like I said, there is a number of agreements that are crit critical for our game's future and the advancement of our game like the CBA, like states agreements, like club licensing agreements, all those things, they need to be resolved. There is a fracture at the moment in the code and we believe there's an opportunity to come back together. Quinn, in, in relation to consent, <coughs> one of the things the NRL's conceded is their trade windows, which they wanted to do. But, and you talk about sort of fans, do you reckon the fans are happy with the situation the way it is at the moment? As an example, Ben Hunt, a, a guy who's uh, reached one for first in Georgia or for two years. He hasn't even started that contract. Already he wants to release. Let's talk about him going to potentially to Brisbane en route to the Gold Coast. Mm. Um, and they've conceded that they're, they're not going to push that any further. Like, is that a good situation for the game? Well, I don't think there's any perfect model, Adrian. I think we've, we've been open. We've given concessions around the restrictions on players, uh, which, we've, which we put forward to the game. You know, ensuring that players don't, cannot negotiate with any other, uh, any other club outside of their incumbent, except for the last 12 months of their agreement. There's some restrictions on players that have, that have played a minimal amount of games in first grade and when they can start negotiating with rival clubs. Uh, but we also believe in strong anti-tampering rules. We get it that fans don't want to hear their players shopped around publicly. It shouldn't be happening, but it is. So we want to make sure that we're bringing in rules that stop some of that language being used. You're never going to stop speculation and innuendo uh, about player movement. But any player that puts in a request for a release, if that gets denied, then it's move on. But our, our position is, first and foremost, contracts are honoured both ways. Players, players to club, club to player. If that then leads to a mutual termination and a mutual agreement, then so be it. Uh, but again, uh, things like trade windows and restrictions on players, that doesn't solve the problem. We've worked through hours upon hours.